Um, so it's just before three, Danielle, did you have anything that you wanted to lead off with as far as any of the logistics before we have Pam start us off? Well, just in terms of logistics, um, again, if you have questions, feel free to, you can use your raise your hand, the raise the hand icon. I'm happy to uh, give you a shout out um, as we go through. Also, the chat will be open, um, but I think that's it. We'll just make sure everyone's muted and so we can all hear. Wonderful. Okay, so um, Pam, if you wanna get started, I will advance slides for you and then um, we'll go from there. Thanks, Trip. Hello, everybody. We're so delighted you all could join us today. Um, this is the Trauma-Informed Communities and COVID-19 presentation, and we're just so very excited um, to have both cohorts one and two joining us today. Um, we're obviously a little disappointed for the reason we need to have the gathering, but we're just so excited to um, see some of our old friends um, and reconnect and then also have the opportunity to visit with those um, from our new cohorts. So everyone joining, you'll just know that it's um, New Hanover, Edgecombe and Wilson and Caldwell counties from last year. And then this year we have Pitt, Chatham and Cabarrus counties um, working with the Trauma-Informed Communities Project. And it's a, a pleasure to have you all. Of course, you'll remember our funding comes through SAMHSA as well as the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. So let's move on, Trip. let's get started. This um, slide we put in here just to give you all um, some guidance. Some of you have been using Zoom. We weren't sure how familiar you'd be with WebEx. Um, and we're gonna be asking you, I'm not sure if it was Danielle or Tripp that shared, we were gonna be doing a lot in our chat boxes today. And so if you'll look down at the bottom of the screen, the, um, there, thank you, Tripp. Um, that little box that he's pointing to, it looks like a cartoon speech bubble um, to me. And that's the chat function. So you'll, you'll click on that and then you'll have the ability and then your chat, you'll notice it'll come up on the right hand side of your screen where you can see um, who all is chatting and what they're saying. All right, next slide, please. Oh, good, there it is in big time. So using that chat function that you have found now, if you will please um, type in and let us know your name, your agency, and your county so we can um, all see who is present today. We're so glad that you all took the time out of your day. We realized that um, uh, it's a privilege um, to have this time with you and we're just so excited. Oh, look at all those names coming in. Oh, this is good. Hey, Jane Morrow. She's the bird lady down in, in New Hanover. She's got the neatest bird pins. I remember that from last year. So this is just so much fun. Oh, wow. Cabarrus, you're here. Thank you for coming. Wow, Chatham and New Hanover schools. Amazing Grace, Gwen's working with us this year. I feel a little bit like um, I'm going to age myself here, but I feel a little bit like that romper room lady who used to pull up that magic mirror and say, I see Pam and I see Johnny. And so I kind of feel like that as I see all these names coming across. We are just so excited that you all have taken time. Uh, it looks like we've got about 67 participants and we're just so very, very excited. I see Terry's name going by. I'm going to stop and just talk briefly. Terry, um, uh, Terry Grant is with the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, and she, um, um, some of you know that um, Paul Savory retired, and Terry is so gracious to be our liaison and our connection um, with, the, with the division this year, and so um, we're just so excited to have her, and I'm glad you could join us today, Terry. excited to be here and I can oh. see that some of the system of care coordinators are joining us which is great and thanks good. for the invitation good 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 all right Rip, you want to let's move us forward and we can take advantage of the next slide so um we should look familiar to most of you all uh, we are your faculty through the center for child and family health um 
we've been um, blessed with uh, being selected to help facilitate the trauma-informed trainings. And we don't take that privilege lightly. Let me tell you that this is something that we all um, believe in very strongly and we're, we're just, we just feel privileged to partner with you all. And we're just so excited to be on this journey with you. Um, we, we will, Danielle, you met earlier. She's hosting our presentation. I saw Jeremy's picture go by, so I know he's hooked in. And then um, I am Pam Price down on the bottom left. And then the other three um, presenters who will be speaking today, of course, Tripp, who started us off, Angela Tuno. I see Angela on my screen. And then Caitlin, I'm hoping you're up there too. I haven't seen your picture go by, Caitlin, but you'll be hearing from all of us um, throughout the day. And we're again, we just appreciate you taking time out of your, um, your day to do this with us. So why we are here today, um, we certainly recognize that this is just a very uncertain time and that the impact of COVID-19, it's, it's just impacted our, our communities, our families, our communities, our youth, our truly our world in such a unique way. Um, I don't think any of us would have ever imagined um, being in this position. And so we wanted to come together and recognize um, recognize you all and in particular the service providers in the communities. And, and we want to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we're learning with regard to COVID-19, particularly where they intersect with um, trauma and trying to remain trauma-informed and, and provide trauma-informed services in this time. Um, we heard that there was a request for a safe space where we could all come together and connect, um, talk about supports and some resources, and, and that's one of the reasons we're here as well. And then lastly, we wanted to share some updates, some needs, and some strategies to um, the COVID-19 response across the um, communities. Right, and Trip, if you'll slide us on, I'm. I really like this slide. Um, I'm just going to ask that for just a moment, you just sit back, be mindful of where you are. We are gathered today for a trauma-informed communities presentation. It is Wednesday, April the fifteenth. It's just a few minutes after three, and we're getting started. Um, Stop and pause just long enough to get kind of ground yourself and get settled and centered on where you are. Uh, just look around your room. I hope it's a room that um, that is filled with some um, some peace and some comfort for you as you as you join this uh, this conference, this teleconference today. And I'm going to ask that um, that you take just a couple of deep breaths. Just breathe in. Nice and deep, and breathe out. One more nice, big, deep breath. And breathe out. Hopefully we're all grounded and ready to learn from one another and just can take advantage of this time together. All right, Tripp, turn it over to you. Thank you, Pam. Um, and. Uh you all for some on the C people to continue to join uh, the meeting, which is um, which is great. Glad to have you here. Um, we want to we're going to try to accomplish quite a lot in the one hour that we have, including we want to uh, towards the end of our hour. We want to hear from each of you in the communities uh, to get some um, feedback from what you're seeing um, strategies that you would you're finding your communities using. So we do want to share across groups, but we want to. We want to share um, some information that could be useful in the way that we're framing some of this work and um, and how communities are talking about it. So uh, one way to start off is just a uh, you guys many of you have seen this slide before. It's um, Dr. Maya Jackson um, and others, um, uh, Frank Putnam and others, kind of put this together. And this was prior to COVID, right? And thinking about many people struggle with 
which terms to use when to even think about uh, child traumatic stress um, and exposure to trauma. And so um, part of the work of your trauma-informed communities, I think, is helping to navigate uh, some of these terms and under, help folks understand where they where they fit. You've heard before our group talk about, um, and this material comes from the resource parent curriculum from the, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, um, uh, that we talk about things like acute trauma as far as single events that are uh, for limited amounts of time. Uh, we talk about chronic trauma um, as far as um, multiple traumatic events that happen over a long period of time. Then we talk about neglect, and this is something that sometimes people struggle to know, is this a traumatic event or not? And um, when we talk about the failure to provide for a child basic needs, um, it also opens the door to other traumatic events. So it does fit in that bucket of trauma exposure um, and thinking about um, a child's ability to recover from trauma is also something that's impacted through neglect. And just trying to go through some terms that you've heard about before, because we're gonna soon get to terms that remember from presentations that you've had before about um, how com it's kind of this combination of chronic trauma uh, overlaid with a lot of uh, really difficult dynamics. Usually these are kids that have been exposed to multiple traumatic events starting at a young age by the hands of a caregiver. And so, we, you know, these are terms that we're familiar with. Um, COVID-19, though, is just such a different type of crisis. And I think what's important is we... Um, kind of think about all those other terms that we've talked about, where there's a clear onset and a clear offset of symptoms or exposure. Um, uh, with COVID, it's not like that, where um, there's a clear onset, but we're not quite sure um, when COVID will really kind of um, uh, fall off or that we won't be in this kind of uh, time of crisis. And so, um, so it's this chronic crisis with stressors that are kind of silent or um, invisible that are hard to kind of put our finger on, but, um, but that lead to, can lead to secondary adversities, which lead to symptoms of traumatic stress. So some of those um, examples of adversities would be the health of self and loved ones, uh, food insecurity, uh, discrimination based on race and ethnicity, vicarious trauma, uh, traumatic grief, uh, moral duress or distress. And so these are things that we're becoming much more familiar with um, and that it affects us in many different ways. This is my slide that I came up with that kind of mirror the other, where these are some of the terms that we're starting to hear applied to COVID. And there's a reason that there's a cross through these is that um, I don't know that they fully describe or accurately describe what the experience is um, when we talk about COVID. So I've heard of mass community disaster, collective trauma, people trying to use ACE language with COVID, um, pre-trauma, or just even as we talk about stressors or adversity. And really um, the way we talk about this now is much more of a, a living through a dangerous time um, instead of a clear um, trauma exposure, if that makes sense. Um, so if you see here, there's this baseline stress um, for all of us. Uh, the idea that we're joining each other probably uh, from each other's homes right now with over 60 plus people is not something that we normally do. Um, thinking about going to the grocery store, I can't imagine that um, there has been a more stressful time going to the grocery store than right now. Loss of routine, loss of connection. Um, uh, kids showing up at work when you, you know, that's not something that's your normal experience, right? So there's this baseline level of stress. And then there are these other stressors that are kind of overlaid uh, on, on this as far as the impact. Um, so school or job changes or, uh, or losses, um, difficulty with food and medical or mental health care access, exposure to COVID either individually or in the family or any deaths that are related um, to COVID. And so this is, um, this is one way of kind of framing what most everybody's experience could be as far as this baseline level of stress. Um, and then as we think about kind of other, uh, other stressors. 
the other thing just to kind of keep in mind is at the core of what we're dealing with right now, we're negotiating these dangerous and uh, times and kind of dealing with safety issues. But as you kind of work your way up this uh, ladder, there's increased risk for impairment. Right? So as we think about negotiating COVID while also having um, maybe more, more or less uh, uh, increased frequency, intensity, and duration of stressors, pre-existing trauma history or symptoms, uh, traumatic losses or, or maltreatment or violence. These are things that really vary depending on the, uh, on the situation or the family where maybe some of us, this most stressful piece of um, dealing with this is how are we going to um, serve in our roles at work and educate our kids um, through virtual uh, school uh, and uh, make sure that we're getting um, uh, toilet paper from the grocery store, right? That could, that it's possible that that's, that's where things kind of lie. But there's so many other um, types of ways that families could be impacted by COVID that I think that's what we're trying to capture here where maybe this is a family that has a family member that's in the hospital um, dealing with COVID symptoms and they're not able to visit them uh, or that they pass away and they're not able to have a funeral in a traditional way to kind of um, celebrate their life or um, that we're seeing more maltreatment or um, domestic violence um, kind of incidents that happen because people are home and they're feeling stressed or maybe they've lost their job or there's different things going on. So really to recognize that to use the traditional terms that we are used to for COVID is probably something that's going to be hard for us to keep doing. Um, we're, I think it's a different set of terms and language that we're going to need around negotiating danger and safety. Um, this is uh, something you might have seen on Facebook somewhere. I'm seeing a lot of different versions of this coming out where um, this kind of idea of who do I want to be during COVID, where they're in this particular example, there's a fear zone, a learning zone, and a growth zone. And as um, champions of trauma-informed practice, we really want to um, encourage you to think about um, how to look at these with a careful eye so that we're not communicating any kind of judgment. Um, so for example, the, this um, graphic says, who do I want to be? So I'm really curious about like, does anyone really have the ability to choose fear versus learning? Or individuals may not have control over their experiencing a stress response. So I think while um, while I think there's a lot of good intent in this, we have to be careful also about how we frame um, what people's choices are. Because maybe some of us have the choice about having a good attitude and making positive meaning of having more time at home and with family, but others are going to be affected in a very different kind of way, and they may not um, see this as super helpful. Um, if that makes sense. And so going back to those phrases of danger and safety, um, we need to approach this time with appropriate appreciation for how changes and losses related to COVID can impact mental health for so many. Um, also really focus on protection right now. How do we protect ourselves or mitigate that risk, um, uh, minimize risk if possible. Understand how some elements of COVID are, tra are traumatic for families, depending on the circumstances. So again, like we said about a family member in the hospital in critical care that can't have visitors necessarily, uh, maltreatment in a home during lock, lockdown. And we also need to be careful to avoid making large generalizations that large group of people will be diagnosed with PTSD. That's one question that I got this week from a national group saying, we're really worried that um, the incidence of PTSD is gonna skyrocket. And it doesn't mean that families won't experience trauma or that kids or families won't experience PTSD, um, but just know that um, COVID in and of itself um, is, is a dangerous kind of situation, but not necessarily something that people will have PTSD from. There's also a need for us to focus on safety. Think about how kids and families might be physically safe during this time of invisible risks associated being with uh, contact with others. And also really think about how do we maintain psychological safety um, for others in the home. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, Angela, I'll take this last slide, I, pr I promise, and then I'll turn things over to you. And so as we're talking today, we're gonna cover a lot of different ways about focusing on taking care of kids and taking care of the workforce. But one thing that we can do is stay informed, to stay balanced, um, thinking about how you'll keep up with 
um, information on COVID um, and then connect, right? So how are we trying to make sure that you're informed about what the current risks are without flooding uh, your TV or your computer screens with what's the latest, because uh, that can be, that can have an effect on us, right? And this is the kind of information we would share with our families as well. And then really thinking about where you get your information and thinking about uh, the most reliable places. So the CDC is obviously one of the first go-tos when it comes to COVID. And then locally, our North Carolina Department of Public Health uh, and within DHHS, and, and also uh, thanks to Terry and others with the Division of Mental Health and really helping us think about what the guidelines are there. So I'll turn things over to Angela. Thanks, Tripp. I have to mute myself first. Um, it's good to see everyone as much as I can see you. I wish it was for a different reason. Um, I'm seeing some familiar names that I haven't seen in a long time. Um, and during this section, we're going to be able to use the chat bar a bit more. So if you don't have it open, go ahead and get it open. I'd love to hear from all of you. Um, and now we're really transitioning to, so now we're trying to define this, this stressor, this danger, and how do we take care of children and families in our communities um, while also taking care of ourselves, which is something Caitlin's gonna go into next. We can go to the next slide, Trip. Okay, so service provision during COVID-19. As you all know, things are changing daily and providers are learning new ways to provide services, balancing multiple roles and managing even being on the front lines. Um, just recently, so over at Duke, I'm a licensed psychologist, I still see patients over at Duke, and we are just getting hooked up with video technology. And there are bumps and bruises along the way, and that's an additional stressor. Folks that have children and are working, having to balance those two roles at the same time isn't something that we're used to. Um, managing even being on the front lines, going into work, or taking care of those who are the front lines is something that we're doing over at Duke too. Um, so all these things are changing and we're, we're stretching our skills and we're trying to be the best, most flexible providers we can be during a time that's uncertain for us too. It's important to recognize that this time can be stressful and people deal with stress in a variety of ways. Tripp, I'm so glad that you said before about that, that one chart with choose how you're dealing with COVID. There's such a judgy tone to that that I don't like. Um, it's okay to deal with COVID the way that you're dealing with COVID and making sure that you're trying every day and approaching every day is new, every minute is new. Um, and I wanna just check in on the chat bar if folks feel comfortable, no pressure whatsoever, but if you want to write in some of the things that you have found new and stressful um, about this time, that would be useful if you wanna open up in the chat bar. And I'll give folks a few seconds. All right, and I have heard from several providers the um, managing pets coming into the room or children coming into the room. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's one of the things too. I'm reading these chats as you see me nod my head. Uh, it is stressful to think about those that we can't reach or are not reaching the children and families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The guilt associated with, with being home, being safe, having all of those um, luxuries and privileges and acknowledging that. Helping family members with pre-existing conditions or elderly. Uh, one of the things that, you know, we're dealing with, too, is technology and elderly. Um, it's been a real challenge of, of helping them be able to access the things that, you know, everyone else is, is doing or may have access to. People who have lost their jobs while wow. balancing personal responsibilities and professional ones, managing employees, not being able to engage with children as, as you wish you could because you have to focus on work. That's that pull, right, of those both roles, that duality. The guilt of being at work every day is I, while everyone else is isolated at home. Yeah. So I'm going to let you all keep keep typing in. I'm just picking and choosing some things that I'm seeing. So if I didn't mention it, it's not because I didn't 
I didn't see it or appreciate it. It's helpful to remind yourself what you can and can't control and trying your best to recognize the difference. You know, there's sometimes everything feels so out of control. Uh, there are things that we can control uh, and we were able to really focus on those things. And if you're recognizing yourself getting in that, I'm trying to control what's, what's out of control realm, being able to focus back in on those things that you can control. Okay. I'm seeing all these great chats, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna just go over some general practices of a trauma-informed approach. And you, you all can see that picture on the side there, that's no accident, right? And I think we hear this analogy quite often of putting your mask on before you put it on others. And that's just critical. Um, it, and acknowledging that it's not so easy to put the mask on these days and finding ways to do that that works for you. So one of these general practices or a trauma-informed approach is that it's important to convey this sense of calm, okay? So what helps you to be able to be this emotional container? You know, what helps you appear calm and have that grounded, that groundedness? So you're gonna be an emotional container for many difficult scenarios and situations. Um, I have a few things that help me stay calm and grounded. I always have. A glass of water, as you can see, wherever I go. Um, I have a favorite area that has light, although the light's shining in behind me, so I kind of look like a shadow more than a person. Um, but figuring out where is the room that helps you feel grounded? Where is the place? Where is your safe space? What are some things that you do? Is it taking a deep breath? Is it sitting with your back against a wall? What helps you to get ready to contain? Um, and for for those of you who are able to chat, you can go ahead and I love getting tips from everybody. So some things that, that you have done to convey that sense of calm and to be ready to be this emotional container. The bat cave, okay. <laughs> Staying in the bat cave. Um, meditation, deep breaths, yes. This is great, a walk. I do that every day too, um, which is unique because I live in downtown Durham which we have to be careful about the social distancing and timing it just right. Working out, dancing, baking, I love this. Acknowledge that this is hard. Yeah, leaning into that. Zoom trivia, karaoke, game, sunshine, fresh air, this is wonderful. Um, yeah, captain's chair, I love that. Spirit, spiritual study and meditation. These are wonderful. Um, I know that Headspace is a meditation app that's actually offering free, um, subscription for providers if you enter your your NPI number. So for those of you who didn't know, jogging with your dog. And then also keep on going, these are good. And ensuring that your basic needs are also met. So making sure you're eating nutritious food and also it's okay if you don't eat nutritious food all the time. Um, staying hydrated, sleeping, social connection, in is going to be different. It's going to need to be flexible and being able to um, support that flexibility is important for yourself and others. All right, next slide. Sure. Thanks. Okay, so one framework for consideration of, of thinking about how to support families and children and yourself. When people are facing stress and difficult life circumstances like we're doing now, it can affect three different areas. Um, and in three of those areas, are a sense of safety and that psychological, physical safety, feelings of connectedness, which is super important right now, given that we're physically distancing. Um, they, they talk about social distancing, but I heard someone say, I don't like the term social distancing, I like physical distancing, because we're still trying to stay connected and social, which I really love. Um, so enhancing those feelings of connectedness and feelings of hope, and we're gonna go into each one of these in a second. In each of these areas, service providers and community members can make an impact and touch on these areas. So we can go into the next one. All right, so when we're talking about safety and we really wanted to focus in on this um, calming and stabilization portion of safety. Now this is from psychological first aid. I'll talk to you all about what that is in a second. Um, but the goals of this safety, calming and stabilization is to enhance immediate and ongoing safety 
and provide that psychological and emotional support. It's to calm and orient emotionally overwhelmed individuals. So the stabilization piece, although this is good for everyone, it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be used for everyone or all of the time. So one of the most important things is this flexible approach. What works for some may not work for others and being able to to use this at the right time. It's to help reorient and comfort individuals, provide information about common stress reactions, uh, self-care, family care, coping strategies. You know, that, that knowledge, that education, that validation of this is what you're experiencing and this is why can sometimes just be a dose enough of education to calm them naturally um, and, and ourselves of, you know, is it is it normal for me to feel all kinds of emotions throughout the day based on the, the news and work and what I'm managing and being able to say, yeah, this is this is new. This is there's no right way to deal with this. Um, so, OK, we can go on to the next one. All right, some example strategies of that stabilization. And I want to highlight here that these don't go in a specific order. These are just three different methods. And one of those is normalization. So if somebody is calling me in crisis or, or in kind of this um, heightened state, it can help to be able to, well, first do some grounding and then tell them, you know, intense, here's an example, intense emotions may come and go in waves. Shocking experiences may trigger strong, often upsetting alarm reactions, that fight, flight, or freeze reactions. And you could explain more, that, that'll that make your heart beat fast, or your stomach clench up, or your muscles feel tight. And that's why you may be experiencing some of the things that we're, you're experiencing now. Um, and then also acknowledging some grounding strategies. And I've heard a ton of grounding strategies here which is wonderful. Um, so you all know these. And sometimes the best way to manage these feelings is to take a few moments for calming. And being able to take some really deep breaths, Pam did a wonderful job walking us through those two deep breaths. That helped me ground myself um, and be able to orient to the here and now. And for those of you who may not know the 54321 grounding, that's using your senses and really orienting yourself into the here and now. So naming five things you might see, four things you can touch. But yeah, good job, Pam, thanks. Four things you can touch, you wanna keep going? Good. Maybe three things you can hear. And going through your senses and being able to use your senses to bring yourself into the here and now. And then connection. Highlight how friends and families are important sources of support to help calm yourself. And people come with natural strengths and natural supports. So we want to make sure to highlight who are those folks that you feel connected to? How are you connecting to them right now? It's something I ask every single patient that I'm seeing right now. How are we getting creative with your connection? Um, making sure that they're still staying connected. Okay, we can go forward, Trip. On that note, so the connectedness, the goal is to help establish brief or ongoing contacts with primary support persons and other sources of support. That can be family members, it can be friends, um, community, community helping resources, really thinking through how are we staying connected? How are our families and the children and adults that we serve staying connected? I like this saying here the social distancing does not mean emotional distancing. I heard that on the news the other night and I ran to my notebook and wrote it down because I thought it was really important. Um, and then I'm hearing more about, let's use the term physical distancing. And given that we're maintaining physical distance, we have to get creative, social connection. And if you all want to, um, write down on your chat bar a little bit about how you're getting creative with social connection so you can share with your with your peers here in your communities. I think that'd be really helpful. One of the things that I've learned about was this um, app called, I think it's Jackbox, and another one called House Party, where you can have book clubs, yeah, family Zoom meetings, those are great, where you can have these game nights with people in your remote locations through video, something kind of like this and um, being able to connect in that way. Yeah, house party. I haven't done it yet. I'm excited to do it. Uh, help individuals think about the type of support that would be most helpful and who they can approach for that support. 
understand their natural resources. Again, they have them. So it's important to talk about where do you find your connection? Um, where are you reaching out for that connection? Okay. Yeah, keep typing those in. Marco Polo is good. I use that one too. Enhancing feelings of hope. The goal is to support individuals moving through this difficult time. And really one of those things is, is really understanding, leaning into that there are things that we know and we don't know. And there are things that we can and that we cannot control and knowing the difference. Um, really focusing on those things that you can control. If you cannot control what's on the news, you can control how much you expose yourself to the news. I was not doing a good job at that at the beginning. I had it kind of constantly rolling until I thought to myself, this cannot be good. And so I limited my time to be able to watch the news only certain times. How can you foster hope in yourself and others? Suggesting asking a good friend or family member how he, she, or they have maintained hope during the pandemic or how you can look at things from a different perspective. Really leaning into those people um, who, who are promoting that hope. What are they trying to stay hopeful? How are they seeing the situation? And again, if watching news reports makes an individual feel hopeless, maybe limiting that or limiting social media and knowing when to do so. Also practicing gratitude individually or with family members. Even a small dose of gratitude or a moment of gratitude is really useful. It, it, it exercises a part of the brain that um, flips it from hopelessness and being able to express gratitude for those things that you can control. Okay. So one trauma-informed intervention for consideration, you heard me mention psychological first aid. And if you all want to, you can um, type in whether or not you've heard of psychological first aid, just as yes or no. If you haven't, um, it is good. I'm seeing some yeses. Um, it is an acute intervention to help children, adults, family, and first responders. Woo, some PFA experts on here. Um, and first responders in the immediate aftermath of a disaster or emergency. What I really like about psychological first aid is it is a modular approach. And what that means is there's, there's eight different core actions and it provides um, some flexibility regarding catering it to what that person needs in that moment. So for example, maybe somebody doesn't need approached at all, or maybe somebody does not need those stabilizations, maybe um, techniques or grounding strategies, maybe they need different tools that you can use based on what you're seeing in front of you. And I love that flexibility because again, um, there is a wide range of how people can respond to things like this. And it's designed to reduce the initial distress caused by traumatic events and to foster short and long-term adaptive function and coping, and coping. It meets four basic on risk and resilience following trauma. So it really leans into people are naturally, um, they're able to pull from this resilience and strength and being able to see what does that person need in order to enhance those strategies that they may naturally have and know where to find them support if they're having difficulty with that or if they're having um, psychological difficulty or emotional difficulty. It's applicable in practical and field settings. It's appropriate for developmental levels across the lifespan. Um, so this is wide ranging. Again, that flexibility is key. It's culturally informed and can be delivered flexibly. So right now on nctsn.org, no, it's the NCTSN Learning Center. I'll make sure I get that right. Um, there is an online training for PFA and I went through it again and it's just absolutely wonderful. There are these applied different scenarios of what would you do? How would you approach this person? What would be the best strategy? So you learn about everything and then you also apply it in this training. Um, and we can provide a link for that as well for you all that are interested. Okay, we can go forward. Caitlin did it. The link's in the chat. <laughs> Thanks, Caitlin. Um, and here is a new resource that the folks over at the NCTSN have put together and they've been working tirelessly on developing some really amazing resources. This is one that I really like. It's helping caregivers explain COVID-19 to children. And it's very user-friendly. It assists caregivers in planning a conversation 
with their family using that developmental developmentally appropriate language. Um, conversation topics can include what is COVID-19, how it's contracted, um, what are possible dangers, protective steps being taken, and protective steps everyone in the family can take as well as the community, nation, and global community. And some of those things are um, like how you wash your hands or how you're supposed to sneeze in your elbow and being able to talk to children and their families about the importance of those things they can control and what they're doing to stay safe. Okay. I think I talked too much. All right, we can go forward, Trip. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and now it's on to Caitlin. Caitlin, I'm going to pass it to you. Thanks, Angela. Um, and it seems like um, a few people are wondering about whether or not we can email links and things like that. What we can do is likely send out these slides for everyone in a PDF. Um, Danielle, please correct me if I'm wrong in the chat box, but um, if you registered, I'm sure that we can try to get these uh, slides to you. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna speed through this pretty quickly um, because we wanna get to some community discussion to hear about what strategies your community is using um, to address some of the concerns and, and stressors associated with COVID. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about taking care of the workforce. And we can think of the workforce in a couple of different ways. So it's not just taking care of yourself, right? You are a part of the workforce, but as well, like in addition to its um, professionals on the front lines, right? across service systems. It could be the medical system um, or, you know, the education system, juvenile justice. We're all in sort of different roles, but this applies to all of us. So go ahead, Trip. So if you've been to the Trauma 101 um, presentations, you've likely seen this, this like multiplex Venn diagram. It's really looking at different ways that trauma um, can impact the workforce. So through secondary traumatic stress, direct exposure, vicarious traumatization. I'm just gonna pull out a couple today and um, discuss them in depth. You can go forward trip. So the first is primary trauma. So this is uh, when individuals, professionals, are exposed directly to events that um, involve a direct threat to the worker or witnessing threats to others, right? So this could be, um, if we're thinking about current uh, events, it could be those on the front lines in the medical system who are witnessing people dying or um, their efforts to save individuals may not be successful. It could be discrimination given of that um, in the United States right now. So just recognizing that um, people on the front lines can be exposed to primary trauma. We're also noticing moral distress. And this is stress that occurs when one believes that they know the right thing to do, but things like institutional constraints make it difficult to pursue the de desired course of action. So what do I mean about, about that? Um, it's really the collision between one's own ethics or morals or values in the, the demands of the workplace. So it could be in the allocation of resources. There might be a correct or right um, of course, like in quotes, course of action, but a professional is unable to take those actions. So this could be experienced by medical professionals on the front lines who want to be able to provide services and medical care to all those affected by COVID, but due to resource restrictions, this might be particularly difficult. So we might see significant moral distress. And then finally, secondary traumatic stress. This is when there's some emotional duress that results when an individual hears about the firsthand traumatic experiences of another person. So this could include hearing a lot of stories or details about someone else's trauma exposure. It could be reading accounts of trauma or abuse, so reading accounts of people who um, have experienced trauma or other secondary adversities through the COVID pandemic. Um, and we are hearing and seeing a lot of distressing stories right now. So I would, you know, recommend um, sort of following the suggestions that Tripp and Angela made about limiting your exposure if possible, particularly if you're starting to feel distressed from those stories. 
And all of these um, impacts or adversities um, can lead to in intrusive thoughts in yourself, uh, avoidance of difficult content, alterations in your mood or what you're thinking, right, or in your arousal. And this can range from very mild symptoms to more extreme symptoms. And so it's just important to, to be aware of, of how you're feeling and, and um, the thoughts that you're having. Go ahead, Trip. So um, I think that there is, we've received this barrage of information about how to take care of ourselves. Um, and I, I am someone who loves to read sort of um, blogs on self-care and in the New York Times and the Washington Post. I love it. I will digest all of it. But right now I have reached my saturation level. Right, and um, you know, my goal isn't really to give you additional strategies, right, because you likely already know the strategies that work best for you to take care of yourself, right? And this is really identifying a potential process um, that can help you identify how you're feeling um, and maybe give you some additional coping strategies. So we can go forward, Trip. This first step is awareness. Right, um, so this is really the idea of if you've been trained in RFR, sensing in, right? If, you've, um, if you know about CBT, it's recognizing how your body, your, the emotion you're having, how your body is feeling. So it's really this challenge or encouragement of checking in with yourself, focusing inward, sort of noticing what your stress level is um, and how you're feeling. Right. What types of thoughts are you having? When I work with little ones, we talk about cold prickly thoughts or warm fuzzy thoughts. It could also be helpful thoughts or unhelpful thoughts. If you sort of approach your mental health from a mindfulness bent, this might be just noticing what's going on, right, and letting those feelings pass through or kind of noticing your emotions and sort of riding that wave of emotion. We all have different ways that we tend to manage or notice our feelings and thoughts. Um, go ahead, Trip. So the first step is awareness. The second step is balance. We've heard balance um, stated a couple of times throughout the presentation. And of course, seeking balance means different things to different people. And I think that's really been coming through, like in all of my clinical cases, all of the work I do with my colleagues, and it's this, um, this gift of flexibility to yourself right, and your colleagues. We're all balancing multiple roles right now, and we've never sort of found ourselves in this experience before. So being really graceful with yourself. And this means sort of balancing your work, your personal life, rest, leisure. Um, and, you know, we all know with the research that taking small breaks um, can actually lead to increased productivity. Um, we are like a production-based uh, society, but we can also think of it as leading to healthier outcomes for ourselves, right? And so use that awareness of yourself to know when you're losing balance and then give yourself that opportunity for change. Go ahead, Chris. And one of those, um, and you can also tell that there is some, some parallel um, there's some parallel frameworks or parallel steps in the frameworks we've been discussing. So that third step, again, is connection. And I really love this quote. Um, it was in another presentation that I was a part of, and I thought I would sort of shamelessly steal it and share it. And it says, there is simply no pill that can replace human connection. There is no pharmacy that can fill the need for compassionate interaction with others. There is no panacea. The answer to human suffering is both within us and between us. And so it's also that, that grace, knowing that sometimes we're going to be irritable and grumpy with our spouse, partner, friends, colleagues, children, um, and just resetting, right, and trying it again next time. You can go ahead, Chris. So I think Angela already asked this question. If you didn't get a chance to share some strategies that you're using to connect with others right now, please go ahead and do so. So if you, you know, you were um, a little bit reluctant before, go ahead now. I have a couple of other slides, Trip, go ahead. 
And, um, and so, you know, we're talking about taking care of yourself. Why haven't I talked about self-care, right? I think in the clinical realm, um, we talk a lot about self-care. And I have a couple of um, larger sort of considerations with self-care. I do feel that sometimes in the United States, it's been glamorized and commercialized, right? Um, it's something that we're encouraged to do outside of the time, you know, we're working or at our organization. And I'm really going to sort of implore that um, as agency directors or leaders, service system leaders, sort of recognizing that self-care doesn't take place in a vacuum, right? Instead, it's something that begins at the organization and an organization can allow for time for self-care. It's not something that can only be done independently. So I love this quote. Um, I, I feel like I include lots of quotes, so I apologize if it's not your thing, but um, hear me out on this one. This is from Brianna Weiss, she is an author. And she says, true self-care is not about salt baths and chocolate cake, it is making the choice to build a life you don't regularly need to escape from. And that often takes doing the things you least want to do. It often means looking your failures and disappointments square in the eye and re-strategizing. It is not satiating your immediate desires, it's okay if it is, right? If you need some chocolate or salt baths, like that's totally fine. But it is making, um, it is letting go. It is choosing new. It is disappointing some people. It is making sacrifices for others. It is living in a way that other people won't. So maybe you can live in a way that other people can't, right? So it's really addressing the boundaries that you've set with others and knowing that self-care sometimes is really hard and it's something that we have to plan into our day um, and, and it might take some time for it to change, right? Um, just like with any behavior that we try to change. Go ahead, Trip. So on this slide, it's just a list of self-care strategies. We've talked about them. I'm sure you have a cadre of your own strategies. Um, but again, I wanted to highlight the third bullet, um, and that is leaning into your team and finding a work buddy, right? So self-care should not be a solely independent task. This is another sort of piece of that of connection. I think that's a recurring theme we're hearing. Um, I hope Angela won't mind me sharing, but this is something that we heard on an earlier call, and it's really being able to reach out on like a daily basis to make sure that other person is doing okay, right? Um, and sharing strategies that are working, or maybe a day was just really difficult, um, and having someone that you can contact readily um, so that you're not in this alone and you've got some support. And I saw some great strategies about having, um, you know, virtual coffee hours once a week with, with your, your staff. So I believe that's it on self-care. I know that was a whirlwind. We have eight minutes to discuss community strategies. I'm going to pass it over to, to Trip so we can sort of finish out this discussion. Go ahead, Trip. Thank you. Um, thank you, Angela. Thank you, Pam, Angela, and Caitlin for um, such a great uh, presentation. And we really wanted to hear, since you guys are our champions in, um, in the state for trauma-informed care, really wanted to hear from you about one area in which your community is needing support. Now, I'll put that out there saying, we want to know so that we can provide um, whatever information, psychoeducation, connection that we can. And it's possible there'll be areas of support that you have that we will not be able to directly address. Um, so need to have a self-care uh, self uh, accountability partner. Um, uh, so maybe, you know, we have folks even on the call that are, are looking for that and, and can, um, can think about connecting to others. Are there other areas of need that you feel like you're identifying in your communities um, you know, knowing that you're really good at using that trauma lens, um, you're really good at thinking about these unique times and thinking about some of the needs that are kind of coming up. I know that um, uh, Terry and others with the division would probably like to know if there are areas that they could provide additional support or technical assistance to. Um, so people are very shy or they're writing very long messages that haven't shown up yet. Um, I can't tell which. Um, Main issues is because things are always changing and so uncertain. We don't know what we need yet. Yeah, that's true. I think um, in the communications, even at Duke, uh, they had to start stop um, sending them daily 
because it was a little overwhelming for people and they even kind of agree to do it twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday. There's a team at Duke that actually sends out updates related to COVID. Um, and I think we all have shifted so much in the last four weeks. Each week has looked very different with the kinds of things that we've um, been focused on and moving from how to do so much telehealth kind of work um, to um, connecting with our jobs. Current unemployment is creating massive group of people experiencing trauma, concerned how you can respond. Yes, um, I think that, yeah, so food is definitely something that's come up. Uh, nonprofit folks needing access to stores um, and to find out the Walmart was closed after somebody's getting out of jail and needed clothes. Um, yeah, day treatment facilities are closed, so kids that have been getting that support are not anymore. Rural areas having issues with telehealth and phone minutes. Yep, um, that's definitely something that we've heard of as well. Emotional support needs, just think materials for young kids to um, play with when at home. Um, alternative to inpatient care for traumatized youth um, that are dysregulated at home. I just talked with a, a national foundation yesterday that focuses on autism and all those services that those kids were getting are now not happening and they're at home with their parents and there's a lot of concern, right? Um, let's see, spending so much time on computers can lend itself to other health concerns, right? How many of you have been thinking about how uncomfortable your chairs are that you have at home for um, day long use, right? Um, locally in the triangle, collecting food, um, materials for teens, special needs kids with high support needs are definitely um, not able to do their schoolwork independently. Right, I'm thinking about my 15 year old and eight year old are not in the worst kind of place of being able to get their work done and it still feels like it's a lot much less for kids that have special needs, right? Difficulty finding therapists to take on new clients, especially through telehealth. I could see how that might be um, an issue. Yeah, so lots and lots of needs that you guys are uh, providing. In our last four or five minutes, I want you to find one trauma-informed strategy or practice that your community is using. What are you learning? So what's working? What are you trying? What are you thinking about? Um, this would be good for um, all the other communities to hear. Um, so day treatment in lieu of services has recently been approved for Alliance, great. So clients who are receiving it may be able to receive it uh, through telehealth soon, awesome. So uh, checking in with your um, MCOs and, um, and uh, your systems of care coordinators and other folks that might have information about um, changes in definitions of service, either definitions of services or access to them would be great. Um, so that's, that's awesome. More frequent and shorter telehealth sessions maintaining connection between children in foster care and their parents. Yes, so thinking about even divorced, this is on another call that we just came off of a little while ago, but divorced parents and visitation schedules and how do you make that happen? Um, telehealth therapy is better than nothing. Yes, um, staying connected um, probably is, we're probably surprised at what we can get done through telehealth that we never thought we could. Using social media platforms to share resiliency skills, yep. School system is hosting virtual healing circles each morning for kids, can call in and share and connect. That's awesome, Beachy. Um, uh, bringing virtual QPR training to teachers. Um, kids are liking telehealth providers as providers say kids like it, uh, kind of liking it to face in time, FaceTime. Um, good, so it sounds like people are really utilizing the resources that they have through either telehealth or other virtual ways of connecting uh, to meet those needs. Um, other trauma-informed strategies that you feel like you're, um, you're using? Um, looks like a new way to recover, um, Facebook page with live events for teens, that's great. Oh, Mevin did a nice job here talking about being flexible about meetings. I, I wanted to say something about that. So, and that CCFH has taken on this thing that I've used in so many of my meetings to say, and not this one, by the way, um, but, but all the others, we have said um, 50 minutes 
is good for a meeting um, so that people can transition from one thing to the other, especially if they've had back to back meetings at home. There's something so different about being on camera and being present this way, as opposed to being around a table or um, in our cars or you know, different places that we're used to. Um, so that's definitely something to consider. Um, let's see, daily check-ins and, and texting with staff. Uh, the Resiliency Collaborative is playing uh, with Flipgrid to share practice and resilience tools. Great. Um, the other thing is just to give permission to people on video calls that um, it's okay for things to happen like pets or um, children that like to visit or uh, needing to put your camera off of your camera. Um, reflective supervision is definitely good. Um, and sometimes replacing video calls with phone calls. I, I just had a conversation with Caitlin this morning about sometimes phone calls without the video are actually kind of refreshing. Uh, there's something different about um, really attending. Um, talk about it. Yeah, good. So we, we want for this to be the start of a conversation. Um, I just flipped through a few resources for you as we're wrapping up and you can think of any last questions that you have. So there are a ton of resources. In fact, we were hesitant to send you every resource that we've come across because it's just so many. Um, but the network and the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has um, come up with the resources for simple activities at home, supporting kids during COVID, um, how to help um, families cope. Uh, which is really awesome, and then how to take care of yourself and um, secondary traumatic stress, um, as well as for the center. Um, we'll send these slides out so you can have access to them. If you have questions for us, uh, feel free uh, to email us, and um, we're just so glad that um, you could be here. Terry, are there any last questions or comments you want to make before we wrap up? Terry might have listened to our 50 minute hour. I'm, not, I'm just kidding. No, 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 I'm here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. Trying to get myself off of mute. Anyway, this has been a wonderful presentation and I echo Lisa Salo, you know, thanks so much for um, opening this up to um, the system of care, other system of care coordinators and their networks. Thanks. Sure. Great. Okay. Well, we'll stop for now. Please reach out if you have questions and thanks again for all of your contributions and joining us today. Appreciate it.